Welcome. In this video, we review recent advances related to coded compressed sensing, and we assume that the viewer is already familiar with the coded compressed sensing scheme. We also assume that they've watched the introductory video in the sequence, and as such, we only review the scheme briefly. We focus on recent advances and hope that the treatment will lead to new ideas and applications. The mathematical model is the standard compressed sensing model where observation y is equal to a times vector s plus some noise. We know that s is sparse with only k non-zero elements, and in our case we also know that s is non-negative. Matrix A is very large, so large in fact that it precludes the application of standard compressed sensing solvers. On the other hand, we have complete control over the design of A and we can also embed some structure in vector s. The approach we adopt to solve this problem is a divide and conquer strategy. The architecture is shown on the slide. Every device starts with a binary message and it encodes the message using a tree code. The code word is then partitioned into blocks. Every block is translated into an index and this index selects the signal that this device is going to send over the multiple access channel. The device then sends one message per slot, and all the device's messages are collectively aggregated over a multi-access channel. The task at the receiver is to recover the original messages, and the decoder does so by first running a compressed sensing solver for every slot, which leads to a list of k elements per slot. It then applies a tree decoder to stitch the messages together. The first idea we wish to explore is an algorithmic enhancement to the decoder for the coded compressed sensing scheme. We realize that the information afforded by the tree code could be used early by the compressed sensing solvers. And this leads to a performance enhancement without altering the encoding scheme from the device perspective. When we presented the architecture for the coded compressed sensing scheme, we essentially viewed compressed sensing solver as acting independently from slot to slot. The observation gained from slot one was decoded and yielded a list of K items for the first slot. And then likewise, the observation from slot two gave a different list and so on. It turns out that the decoding on the first slot and the recovered fragments can inform the decoding of the second slot. And once the first two slots are decoded, this information can also be used in the decoding of the third slot from a compressed sensing perspective. And this arises because the parity patterns of the fragments that are recovered in the early slots determine the set of possible messages for the subsequent slots. Let's look at this a little bit more closely. Suppose, for instance, that the first three slots have been decoded, and we're now looking at the compressed sensing task for the fourth slot. On the left, we have the list of all active paths that are obtained by running the tree decoder in parallel from all the root fragments. And so these are the set of possible messages for the first three slots. Attached to each of these messages corresponds a parity pattern that could happen for slot four. So if we take all the parity patterns that can be constructed based on the list of active paths, we get the set of possible or admissible patterns for slot four. Anything that did not get reached from the list of active paths can therefore be discarded preemptively before we run the compressed sensing process for slot four. And this is really the algorithmic opportunity that we seek to take advantage of. To further illustrate this concept, we look at the set of possible indices for slot four. Based on the active path for slot one, two, three, then there's a set of possible parity patterns for the next slot. And attached to these parity patterns are some indices and they're shown in green in this vector. The locations in white can no longer be reached based on the set of active paths. And so what we can do with the sensing matrix A is to retain the columns that are still possible but then delete all the columns that are now inadmissible, or in other words, they can never be reached based on the active list. So with that, we reduce the size of A to a prune matrix, 
and we reduce the complexity of the compressed sensing solver. We can look at the benefits of column pruning in matrix A. To do so, we leverage some of the work we've done in a previous video where we computed the computational complexity of the tree decoder. This gave us an expression for the expected number of paths that are alive at stage L. And assuming that the number of paths is close to its mean, we can get an approximation for the number of active parity patterns at that stage. And this is the expression that we see close to the bottom of the slide. Then this gives us the number of columns we must retain in A, and correspondingly, we also have the number of columns that can be pruned. So the expected column reduction ratio is given by this expression, and for the parameters of interest, it is often much less than one. We see on this next slide a graphical representation of the benefits of column pruning as a function of the slot. On the x-axis, we have the number of messages, k, and on the y-axis, we have the column reduction ratio. Of course, there is no reduction for slot 1, as this process needs to be bootstrapped. But starting with slot 2 for low counts of messages, we see some significant gain already, and as we go deeper into the process, the benefits are greater. These curves are given for a typical set of parameter, and the pruning is more pronounced at later stages. We can see that this approach can greatly reduce the width of the matrix for the compressed sensing solver. We can look more closely at the implications of dynamic pruning. When the early stages of the decoding are successful, then the true fragments appear on the lists and this leads to the correct pruning of the current sensing matrix. This steers the compressed sensing solver in the right direction, and it's bound to improve performance. When a neuronous path survives, then the parity patterns attached with that path will be retained, and this will lead to a less aggressive pruning of matrix A for the current stage. This is not a big problem, because the correct vector will still be in the range of A. A more difficult situation arises when a valid subblock is discarded. In this case, the parity pattern attached with this subblock may be labeled as inadmissible and the corresponding columns of A will be discarded. At this point, the correct message for that particular device can no longer be found, but this was the case before. A more subtle occurrence is the fact that now the true signal no longer lies in the range of A and this can lead to some sort of noise amplification. Fortunately, the benefits of column pruning seems to far outweigh the downsides of this algorithm. So overall performance seems to improve drastically, and we'll see that in a graph in a minute. There are immediate consideration beyond just the performance improvements. In particular, the new scheme invites a reparameterization of coded compressed sensing. Recall that the size of A was originally selected to make it possible to use standard compressed sensing solvers in the context of coded compressed sensing. If A is pruned dynamically, then maybe we can start with a wider A, knowing that with high probability, it will be reduced to a size that can be handled by these same solvers. So one question is, how can we allocate information in parity bits differently, knowing that we'll perform column pruning with the matrix A. Another interesting question, and that's one that's largely beyond coded compressed sensing, is how can one design good matrices for compressed sensing knowing that they will be pruned dynamically? This seems to be a problem in compressed sensing that has not been looked at, and so maybe it's an opportunity for new analysis. To further illustrate this point, we look at the difference between a standard allocation of information and parity bits and a new possibility. At the top, we have a vector that's the standard allocation. The first component only has information bits, and every subsequent section has a mix of information bits and parity bits. All the slots are the same size, and they are bound by the complexity that we can handle with CS solvers. Knowing that you will perform dynamic pruning of the columns, maybe you can use a different allocation. In this problem, the first slot is the same since we cannot do dynamic pruning for that slot. But the subsequent slots are wider. 
This leads to a larger sensing matrix, but hopefully after pruning, the matrix will be reduced down to a size that can be handled by the CS solvers. Another benefit is that it reduces the slot count, making wider slots, and this circumvents some of the limitations that are attached with the finite block length bound for multiple access. On this graph, we explore the benefits of dynamic column pruning. On the left graph, the x-axis represents the number of messages, or the sparsity of S, and the y-axis is a measure of performance in the form of the minimum EB over N0 to achieve the desired probability of error. The top curve is the performance of the original compressed sensing scheme. The solid green line is the same scheme, but with the enhanced decoding technique. And the third line is the reparameterized system. On the right, we have a graph that seeks to capture computational complexity. The x-axis is the number of messages, and the y-axis is normalized execution time, where the performance of the standard compressed sensing algorithm is used as a normalization factor. The solid green line is for the pruning, which showcases significant benefits in terms of computational complexity reduction. And the dashed green line is that of the reparameterized system, where once we enlarge the slots back, complexity essentially rises to the original level. We also offer a one-slide summary for the design challenge for a matrix that's going to be stochastically pruned. So suppose that you have two parity bits, then the columns of A will be partitioned into four sets, and then these sets will be pruned dynamically based on the previous slots. So what you want to design for is matrices that once pruned are good compressed sensing matrices. The columns within a parity group need to be well separated, and the columns for distinct groups are less likely to appear together in the pruned A. The question is, what are good designs? The next design we explore is the notion of jitter or asynchrony. When several devices are using a same channel, then their code words can arrive at the destination with a little bit of delay differences. So instead of having completely synchronous messages, the matrix A gets some sort of distortion where the columns are brought up or down. And so the idea that we use to control this is to discretize the jitter and then construct a larger matrix to be able to handle that. The enlarged matrix then looks like this, where the width of the matrix account for the number of delay profiles. This is still a compressed sensing problem, albeit one with a wider A that may be slightly more complex, but it can handle the jitter. The final idea we explore was proposed by Fengler, Jung, and Kyrie, and it draws a connection between coded compressed sensing and sparse regression codes. To explain their idea, we revisit the coded compressed sensing framework that we've devised. So here we think of every set as being disjoint. Information messages are partitioned into blocks, which leads to index vector, and it produces signals that are aggregated within a slot. The slots are divided through time. And so there's a natural progression from the first slot to the second slot to the third slot. The aggregate index vector for this scheme is very close in spirit to the design of sparse regression code, where every section is supposed to be one sparse. Conceptually, coded compressed sensing is equivalent to having a very large sensing matrix whose block diagonal and also having a sensing matrix who is a collection of one sparse sections from a device point of view. The complexity reduction not only arises from the block structure of the matrix, it also comes from a drastic reduction in the length of the vector. Instead of having a vector of length 2 to the m, we have a vector of length 2 to the m divided by l, where l is the number of sections. This connection was first identified in the context of unsource multiple axis by Fengler, Jung, and Kairi, and they realized that using a signal of smaller length, the matrix A was not quite as wide, and it was therefore amenable to approximate message passing. We reproduced the form of the approximate message passing algorithm that we've seen in previous videos on this slide. 
The algorithm is a two-step composite algorithm where at the top we see the computation of the residual and at the bottom we have the computation of the effective observation. Knowledge about the problem structure typically go into the design of a denoiser and for the problem at hand, Fengler, June, and Kari had to create an entirely new denoiser of low complexity. They came up with the posterior mean estimate, which is essentially the expected value of a signal component given the effective observation for that specific component. The performance of the EMPS for Sparks algorithm is quite good, and it is shown to be asymptotically optimal in this context. It also invites new designs and new ideas for coded compressed sensing, which we will see in our next presentation. This concludes our survey of recent advances for coded compressed sensing.